guys, it's Nick the Booksmith. Welcome back, welcome back. While I finish up the eco print book, I wanted to tell you all a little story about a girl named Pam. But I gotta warn you, it's a wild one. With so many twists and turns, you may get a little seasick. So grab a cup of tea and a handful of crackers. You're gonna need them. Pamela Newman Hupp grew up in a traditional Catholic household in Delwood, Missouri. She was the third of four kids. By her senior year, she was dating a popular boy from school. They went to their senior prom together, and three months later, they um, <clears throat> had to get married. Six years down the road, she was divorced from him, but it wasn't long before Pam married a man named Mark Hupp. They settled down with her daughter, and soon they had a little boy together. Pam started working in a state farm insurance office doing clerical work when she met a girl named Betsy Faria. Betsy was warm-hearted and bubbly, if not a little scatterbrained. I mean, we can relate. She had scores of friends who absolutely adored her. She was 32 years old, which was 11 years younger than Pam. She had curly hair, rosy pink cheeks, and the brightest, happiest blue eyes. In 2010, Pam wasn't working anymore. She claimed disability from a work accident. Apparently, it's hazardous working for an insurance company because she claims a filing cabinet fell and hit her on the head, I guess. Yeah. Pam and Betsy had lost touch for several years, but when Betsy learned that she had breast cancer in January of 2010, Pam was Johnny on the spot to offer support, and she would take Betsy to her chemo sessions. In October of 2011, Betsy learned that the cancer was terminal. It had spread to her liver. Pam started to spend nearly every day with Betsy. And Betsy started worrying about her two daughters and worrying about their future. And the one thing that she, that she had on her mind was that she had this life insurance policy, but she was afraid that her husband, Russ, might not be the best with the money and he might, quote unquote, piss it away before her daughters were old enough to even benefit from it. On December 23rd, Pam and Betsy went to the library in Wing Haven, where Betsy asked a librarian to witness her signature on a change of beneficiary form. It was to remove Russ and make Pam the sole beneficiary of Betsy's $150,000 life insurance policy. On Tuesday, December 27th, so four days later, Pam showed up at Betsy's mom's apartment to take Betsy to her chemo session. Janet, which is Betsy's mom, told Pam, well, she already left. She went with her friend Bobby. So Pam drives down to the cancer center in St. Peter's and sits with Betsy and her friend Bobby for the treatment. And Betsy was really surprised when Pam shows up. And this is because she had already texted Pam earlier to tell her that Bobby was taking her to chemo. And Pam had texted back, bummer. <laughs> so, okay, why are you here? After the treatment, Pam drove home and had dinner with her husband, then drove back to Betsy's mom's apartment in Lake St. Louis to drive Betsy home. Tuesdays, which today is a Tuesday, December 27th, Betsy's husband, Russ, had game nights with his friends. And he had planned on picking up Betsy afterward because her mom only lived five minutes from his friend's house. So he texted Betsy around noon saying, going to game, then come to get you. We'll call when on the way, shouldn't be too late. Betsy texted him back, okay, great honey. After chemo, she texted, Pam Hupp wants to bring me home to bed. And she added that her white blood cell count was low and she needed to rest. And I can attest from personal experience, when your white blood cell count is low, you don't have a ton of energy. <laughs> Russ texted back to make sure she is bringing you. And Betsy replied, yes, she offered and I accepted. Didn't get much sleep, mom snored. 
So when Pam showed back up at Janet's apartment, she got Betsy and they set out for Betsy's house in Troy. When they pulled into the driveway, Pam called up her husband to put Betsy on the phone. And Betsy said, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Earlier that day, Betsy's husband had worked from home until five o'clock. After he called Betsy, got gas at the Conoco station in Troy, he called his mom to tell her that he wouldn't have time to swing by for dinner. At 5.56 p.m., he stopped at a convenience store and bought two bottles of Snapple. Then he met his friends at Mike Corbin's house, which was another friend, around 6 o'clock. They watched movies and smoked a little pot. About 9 o'clock, Russ took off. He stopped at an Arby's for a snack and ate as he drove the 24 miles back home. He got his stuff from the car, walked inside the house, slipped out of his jacket, and stepped into the living room. Betsy was lying on the floor. He later would say that his first thought was that maybe she was sick. But when he knelt down next to her, he noticed the blood matting in her hair and blood had pooled around her neck. He saw that her wrists were cut and there was a handle of a knife sticking out of her throat. She had tried to end her life before by cutting her wrists. And with the latest news of the terminal cancer, he immediately wondered if maybe she had tried again but he just drops everything, grabs the phone, and calls 911. When first responders arrived, they found Betsy cold and getting stiff. Some of the blood on her wrists were already dry, and they concluded that she had died more than an hour earlier. Russ had told the 911 dispatcher, my wife killed herself which the first responders thought was ridiculous considering that she had been stabbed over 50 times. But just a little side note, you know, he's panicking because there's blood everywhere and he knows his wife is on the floor. Something's horribly wrong. And who knows where your brain goes? Might not immediately go to somebody's murdered my wife. Maybe you think I found her you know, bleeding before, and it was because she was trying to end her life. So maybe that's where you go. I don't know. I've never been in that situation, and I hope none of us are ever in that situation. But who knows where your brain goes? A search would turn up a pair of bloodstained slippers that Russ would commonly wear in the back of his closet. The first officer on the scene was Sheriff's Deputy Chris Hollingsworth, and he noted that Russ was visibly upset, but had, quote, limited tears coming from his eyes, appeared to be in a state of panic, having difficulty talking and breathing. But when Hollingsworth sat with him in the police car and was trying to distract him with talks about the neighborhood that they had both grown up in. He said Russ chatted normally for a while, even laughing, and this struck the police as suspicious. The next afternoon, Russ took a polygraph test and was told he failed, which made the detectives sure he was guilty. No one else that has any kind of motive, monetary or crime of passion. I can't tell you what I don't know. I don't know. Another side note here, I'm just gonna put this in there. We all know that polygraph tests are absolute and utter bullpucky and why the police continue to use them and rely on them is beyond me. So yeah, but anyway. Police had also talked to Pam by this time and she told them that Betsy was hoping that she and Russ could move into her mom's old house. And Pam said that Betsy was gonna mention it to Russ that evening, but that she knew he'd just be furious. Pam told them that she felt guilty about leaving Betsy to face her husband alone because he was such a violent person. Between what the police saw as a rocky history of their marriage, then they learned that Russ would sometimes play role-playing games with his friends, so like Dungeons and Dragons. So they're like, oh, dark fantasies of murder. And then he would be calm and then hysterical while they were talking to him, you know, while his wife's dead on the floor. And then Pam says that he has a temper. Well, the police were like, oh, case closed. <laughs> to quote the wonderful Bailey Sarian, I'm not laughing because this is 
funny by any means. I'm laughing because this is so ludicrous. It's just beyond me. On January 4th, Russ was charged with first degree murder and armed criminal action. Meanwhile, Pam is still cooperating and inserting herself with the sheriff's office. She offered up her DNA and her fingerprints. And on another interview with the police, she thought Russ was home early because of the silver Nissan in the driveway. First, Pam said she didn't go inside the house. Then she said that she just went in to turn on a hall light because it was dark. Then she said she went all the way back to the bedroom because Betsy wanted to show her a jewelry box Russ had given her for Christmas. And then she said when she left, Betsy was rolled up in the blanket on the couch, all snug as a bug. Which makes me wonder if she thought Russ was home because there was a car in the driveway already and she went into the house and all the way through the house and back to the bedroom and then back out and got Betsy all snug on the couch with a blanket. Where, where's Russ? It, it's not a big house. Where is he? Is he hiding in a closet somewhere? Anyway, after Russ was charged, um, his cousin hired Joel Schwartz to serve as his defense attorney. And as Schwartz read through the police reports, a billion questions flooded his brain. Like, why aren't they looking at this Pam Hook lady? She was the last person to see Betsy alive. Four days earlier, she had been made the sole beneficiary of Betsy's life insurance policy. Plus, she'd given the police multiple versions of the same story. And she had no alibi. She just said she went home. Russ, on the other hand, had four people swearing he'd been with them all evening and didn't leave until nine o'clock. One of the officers would time himself driving from the friend's house back to Russ's house, and he clocked it at 23 minutes. But one, he was a police officer driving fast. He would even drive up in the shoulder to avoid getting delayed by traffic. He did not stop at Arby's to buy any food. And the police had already found a crumpled receipt in the back of Russ's truck that was time stamped at 909, like back by his friend's house. That was already established. So even if Russ had made it home in 23 minutes, which is unlikely, but let's just devil's advocate say he did, he would have only had nine minutes to kill his wife. Y yeah, wow. But forensics did not find a speck of blood on his body, under his fingernails, or on his clothes. And it's important to note that he was still wearing the same clothes that were captured on security cameras earlier during his errands that he was running. When he filled his car, when he stopped for Snapple, he was in the same clothes. But the police and the prosecutor spun this CCTV footage as suspicious behavior. Like, was he creating an alibi by getting on camera in all these places? No, there's just cameras everywhere. Anyway, what? wow, okay. Let's move on because my brain's about to break. The strongest evidence in the prosecutor's case was the presence of Betsy's blood on Russ's slippers. But his attorney, Joel Schwartz, felt sure that they had been purposefully dipped in blood and placed in his closet to frame him because there wasn't any blood on the soles of the slippers. It was just dripped on top. It was also strange that Pam had been swabbed for DNA, but no results were ever recorded. Nobody ever confirmed that she had worn the clothes that she said that she was wearing. Nobody tested those clothes and nobody tested her car for blood. When State Farm contacted a detective, uh, Ryan McCarrick, he assured them that Pam was not a suspect and that they shouldn't have any concerns about sending her the payout from Betsy's life insurance policy. So, nope, she's fine. She's good as gold. Send her the money. Russ Feria's murder trial began in November of 2013. The Lincoln County prosecutor at this time, her name was Leah Askey, and she opened her arguments by saying that the motive was greed. And she painted Russ as a violent man who believed he was still the beneficiary of his wife's insurance policy. Also, <laughs> Hold on to your butts. Unbelievably, the investigators never mapped out Russ or Pam's cell phones the night of the murder. But Joel Schwartz 
um, he thought of this and he brought in a forensic computer expert who testified that Russ's phone was still at least 10 miles from his house at 925 and it didn't reach his house until 937. Russ called 911 at 940. So there's that. And what about Pam's phone? Well, Joel Schwartz was not allowed to ask about that in front of the jury. He also was not allowed to bring up that Pam may have a motive because she was the new beneficiary of Betsy's life insurance policy. And this is because the prosecutor, Leah Askey, had successfully argued before the judge that Pam had no direct connection to the case. It, in her brain, it was like, Russ is guilty, it's the husband, case closed, nobody else has any connection to this crime. That's it. It was getting to be a desperate point, and the attorney, the defense attorney, made what's called an offer of proof. And so he questioned Pam when the jury was out of the room, but for the record, about the life insurance money. Five days earlier, she had finally put $100,000 in a trust for the girls. What about the other 50 grand? Pam would say a lot of things. She said, my other girlfriend died of breast cancer in August, and she has a 12-year-old daughter that I'm trying to help. Spoilers, Pam did not help a 12-year-old girl, so there's that. Then she says, well, my mom just died of Alzheimer's, so I'm taking care of that. But Pam Hupp's mom did not die of Alzheimer's. Shirley Newman was definitely showing signs of dementia, but what killed her was a fall from the balcony of her third floor apartment. She had eight times the typical dose of Ambien in her system. An engineer would note when he was investigating the structure of the balcony that two of the upright metal balusters were broken free and on the grass below, and four others had been bent outward, but the guardrail at the top was still intact. And he said he didn't think that there was any way that an elderly woman could fall against that balcony railing with enough force to not only break the balusters and bend them outwards, but then to fall through them. Shirley lived at Lakeview Park, which was an assisted living community. And on October 30th, the community manager told police that Pam brought her mom back around five o'clock and that she told the staff not to expect Shirley for dinner that night or breakfast the next morning, but that she would probably eat lunch. When Shirley didn't show up for lunch, a housekeeper went in to check on her and found the apartment door cracked. Water was running in the bathroom and she noticed that the patio door was open. When she walked out to the patio, she of course saw the broken balcony railing and she looked over and found Shirley lying in the grass below. Shirley had been confused recently. Maybe she forgot that she had taken an Ambien and then proceeded to forget seven more times and retake the Ambien and then fall through the balcony railings. So may maybe, I mean, the police did investigate, but they didn't see anything suspicious because, you know, why would they? And um, Shirley's death was ruled an accident. Pam also promised that she didn't use the money when she and Mark bought a new four bedroom house earlier that year. Nope didn't use a penny. But what's most unbelievable was later when she was interviewed, she admitted that she had emptied the trust a few weeks after Russ's trial. Police asking me if I did it, I should do it, it would help their case. Detective Carrick told me, you can do what you want with it, it's yours, but we would like for you to set up a trust for the girls. It's and a how, revocable trust, so I just revoked it. How did you do I revoked the funds. It was my money. She didn't want her daughters to have the money. She didn't want her mom to have the money, her sisters to have the money. So it was your impression that she wanted you to have the money. Is that right? That's correct. And she did this because she was hurt because of what Betsy's daughters were saying about her. 
Well, they wanted, they needed the money from their mom's life insurance policy. Their dad was in prison and this lady cashed out on their mom's life insurance policy and wasn't giving them any, nothing. Yeah. I told you, I told you, I told you this is crazy. On February 24th of 2015, Russ Ferrier's case was remanded after a successful appeal and Russ was acquitted of all charges and released from prison. The prosecutor that also tried to make sure Russ stayed in prison in the second trial still maintained that he was guilty and she had no intention of charging anybody else with Betsy's murder. In an exclusive with the I-Team, Cheney said she still believes Faria's prosecution was valid. I mean, it's not the hill I would choose to die on, but you be you, lady. In 2016, on August the 16th, Pam Hupp shot a man to death at her house. On the 23rd of August, the St. Charles County prosecuting attorney and the chief of police announced their theory that Pam had lured this man to her house by saying she was a Dateline producer and offered to pay him $1,000 to reenact a 911 scenario for the show. Then she shoots him in cold blood. But why? Why would she do this? And she admitted she shot him. Well, it was to frame Russ Feria again. Apparently, she had approached several people before she found Louis Gumpenberger outside the apartment he shared with his mom and his son. One woman had even filed a police report saying she'd been nearly scammed by a blonde lady claiming to work for Dateline, but that she backed out when there was no camera crew and the lady didn't have a business card. So she was like, I'm out, this is sketchy. Louis Gumpenberger had significant mental and physical disabilities that had resulted from a car crash. But when Pam shot him in her home, she claimed to the police that he had chased her into the house and he tried to kidnap her, so she had to shoot him. In his pockets, they found $900 wrapped up in plastic bags. The serial numbers on four of the bills lined up sequentially with a $100 bill in Pam's possession. Also, they found a handwritten note in his pocket saying, it's hard to read, but kill Pam Hupp, take her to the bank to get Russ's money and leave it in a wood pile at Feria's house. When the police interviewed Russ, that last detail was a little confusing. And then he remembered that his dad had some landscaping timbers in the front yard. And Russ's sister said, you know, our neighbor has a security camera. Thankfully, this neighbor offered to go through the footage. And he called Russ and he said, hey man, I got her. She drove by going one way and then the other way going really fast. A GMC Acadia with some kind of I love dog sticker in the window. The St. Charles County prosecutors charged Pam Hupp with murder, and they said they were going to seek the death penalty if she was convicted. But in June of 2019, Pam entered an Alford plea and waived her rights to a jury trial. And an Alford plea is kind of like you're saying that they have enough evidence to convict you even if you didn't commit the crime. So, whatever. This took the death penalty off the table and she was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Since then, there have been some developments. Russ Faria settled a lawsuit he filed against Lincoln County and the police for $2 million. So good for you, Russ. And another happy note for him, he started a relationship with a woman he met during one of these trials and she apparently was one of the people that Pam had approached and tried to scam into this, uh, hey, I'm a Dateline producer, let's make a 911 reenactment video and I'll give you $1,000. So she could have been a victim, but she wasn't. Yeah, so that's kind of cool that they got together. Pam's mom, Shirley, her death certificate was changed from accidental to undetermined although there have been no charges filed against anyone in connection with that. And then in July of last year, 2021, Pam Hupp was officially charged 
with murder in the first degree. She still denies she had any involvement in Betsy's death because of course she does and has pled not guilty. But I look to see some more information coming out on this as the investigation goes forward. And I am happy to say that the original prosecutor and detectives that were involved in convicting Russ Beria are no longer in the picture. There is a new group of individuals that are investigating this case. And thank goodness, because the original ones need to find other jobs in other fields and never do this again. So just my opinion, but there it is. There's a mini series type thing going on where uh, Renee Zellweger is playing Pam Hupp. And I did see the first episode. They're taking almost a dark comedy kind of a swing like Fargo with this. So check it out if you're into that kind of thing. I think that's why this case has been brought to light a lot more is because of the Dateline episodes and this new miniseries that has been coming out. Well, that is all I have on this one. And that was a doozy, right? That was a doozy. Are y'all seasick? Thank you all so much for hanging out with me while I chatted about this story and finished up the eco print book. I hope you have a great weekend and I will see you all really, really soon in the next video. Bye guys.